At this point, anarcho-capitalists are probably very familiar with Adam Something's video allegedly dismantling anarcho-capitalism. From the beginning, I had many problems with this video, starting with its ridiculous premise, which is essentially, hey, I'm going to read a bedtime story and say what is going to happen, and this bedtime story dismantles your entire ideology because I said so. Outside of the brief discussion on Iceland in the beginning, Adam doesn't bring up real-world examples, and he does not use any sort of economic theory, especially not the Austro-Libertarian theory, which is commonly held among anarcho-capitalists. Adam Something's video was obviously extremely bad faith. He clearly did not read any literature related to anarcho-capitalism. He didn't want to try to understand the ideology, he didn't want to try to critique it, he just wanted a little bit of fun for his echo chamber. And before I get into this, I would like to extend the invitation for Adam Something to debate me on anarcho-capitalism. I know it's very difficult actually talking to people who disagree with you, rather than just writing a script and strawmanning them all you want, but I think it might be very productive. Anyways, without further ado, let's get into his video. Now, one thing that Hankeps like to bring up to help support the viability of their ideology is the so-called Icelandic Commonwealth, which was, for all intents and purposes, a proto ncap society in the Middle Ages. Now, it did manage to exist from 930 until 1262-63, when the Icelanders apparently voted to ask the King of Norway to take over their country. And to quote from the Icelandic Commonwealth's Wikipedia page from the Decline and Fall section, In the early 13th century, the age of the Sturlungs, the Commonwealth began to suffer from chaos and division resulting from internal disputes. Originally, the Godar chieftains function more as a contractual relationship than a fixed geographic chieftaincy. However, by 1220, this form of communal leadership was replaced by dominant regional individuals who battled with one another for more control. One historian argues that the chaos and violence of this period stemmed from an imbalance of power and changes in the nature of Icelandic warfare. Whereas the number of Godar had been at least 39 in the early Icelandic Commonwealth, a few powerful families had consolidated control over most of the Godar in the late 12th century. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of using Iceland as an example of anarcho-capitalism. I think it had some of the anarchy part down, but the capitalism part was a bit mixed. During this time in Europe, in general, there were many conflicts, and I believe many other parts of Europe which had states or had very different systems of governance had very similar problems. The question is whether or not Iceland did better than the alternatives, which is something I will get back to in just a few moments. Now, Iceland is mostly a great example of private law. And that's what thinkers like David Friedman use it as an example of. Friedman writes, Medieval Icelandic institutions have several peculiar and interesting characteristics. They might have almost been invented by a mad economist to test the lengths to which market systems could supplement government in its most fundamental functions. Killing was a civil offense resulting in a fine paid to the survivors of the victim. Laws were made by a parliament, seats in which were a marketable commodity, Enforcement of law was entirely a private affair, and yet these extraordinary institutions survived for over 300 years. And the society in which they survived appears to have been many ways an attractive one. There are many other historical examples of private law, such as the Zir system in Somalia, the system of the Caspians, the system of the Akkadians, and many systems that existed in the American Old West. As for the question on whether or not Iceland performed well compared to its peers, Friedman writes, The quality of violence, in contrast to other medieval literature, is small in scale, intensely personal, and relatively straightforward. Rape and torture are uncommon, the killing of women almost unheard of. In the very rare cases when an attacker burns the defender's home, women, children, and servants are first offered an opportunity to leave. One indication that the total amount of violence might have been relatively small is a calculation based on the Sterling Sagas. During more than 50 years of what the Icelanders themselves perceived as intolerably violent civil war, leading to the collapse of the traditional system, the average number of people killed or executed each year appears, on a per capita basis, to be roughly equal to the current rate of murder and non-negligent manslaughter in the United States. In a peer-reviewed paper published in the Journal of Political Economy, economists Peter Leeson and Vincent Galoso point out several empirical examples of stateless societies performing better than their state-ran counterparts. They use as examples a few papers written by Leeson himself, looking at Somalia under its stateless phase, as well as similar papers written by other authors, 
and also looking at another paper by Candela and Goloso comparing stateless Acadia to its counterparts such as Quebec. Goloso and Leeson state, private institutions, most notably for the governance of conflict, were associated with higher living standards, not lower ones. This particular paper itself looks at Iceland. They state, our study contributes to this literature by considering a favorite example of anarcho-capitalist, medieval Iceland, which was also governed privately. The authors look at the limited data on human height, wages, and population growth, and conclude that living standards in a state-governed medieval Europe do not seem to have been higher than they were in Iceland. So now that Adam's real-world example of Iceland has fallen apart for him, let's look at his bedtime story and point out some of the numerous flaws in it. Over here we have a network of smaller settlements, each operating their own basic infrastructure just like during medieval times. In these settlements, eventually some people start getting more successful at capitalism than others, let's call them great men. And we'll be focusing on one of them, this fellow called Billy Bob, living in the town of Einvale. Now Einvale does have its own little water system, but the water quality is not the greatest. It's drinkable, but it tastes kind of funny, and if you have any sort of stomach problems, it just tends to make the problem worse. Now Billy Bob runs a saloon in town, and he thinks the water quality is hindering his sales because it makes his liquor taste worse. And to help his business smoother, using his knowledge of distillers, he puts together a water purifier so he can disconnect from the local water system and save money, and also have better tasting liquor. Now his water purifier ends up being a success, able to produce large quantities of water with a low energy cost, which is somewhat even better quality than the water from the system. Now he produces more water than he needs by a considerable margin, so he starts selling it off to people. With those profits, plus his increased revenue from liquor sales, he puts together a second machine in his free time. This time he works out some of the bugs, and the new machine turns out to be slightly more efficient and produces even better quality water. He now sells a lot of water and makes large amounts of money. Now Billy Bob is forward thinking and keeps reinvesting his revenue back into his business. With his profits, he buys a plot of land behind the saloon and builds a huge water storage tank. He also builds out pipes to the farmlands nearby and starts selling his water to the farmers. With his increasing profits, he hires workers to build and maintain water purifiers. Now one of my main problems starting off is this extreme vacuum of a situation. With a populace that really needs water, if the water is not good water, then there would be a large demand for good water. What would likely happen in real life is people would begin to drill wells, people would buy their own water purifiers which are readily available due to modern capitalistic production, and people may even import water. Obviously Adam Something's example is meant to be simplistic, but the thing is he makes it too simplistic to where it doesn't really make sense. If I were to just argue against the situation at face value, that would be very difficult because he sets the stage in such an unrealistic world. This actually reminds me of a video I saw of an economist talking about competition. And in this video he says, well, let's say you have McDonald's and Burger King across the street from each other. They might lower their prices to an extent to attract more customers, but at some point they wouldn't really bother doing this because they can just keep their prices equal and get plenty of customers anyways. But of course he fails to realize that Burger King and McDonald's function in pretty different ways and they have different tasting food. Some people may just prefer Burger King and they may want to pay more for Burger King's burgers and some people may prefer McDonald's. So both Burger King and McDonald's are incentivized to make their food not only the more affordable but also the better tasting. So yeah, competition does exist and putting people into these ridiculous vacuums doesn't make any sense. It completely ignores that human beings are, well, human beings and not robots. Soon enough, he has enough capital to offer a handsome amount for the local water system. The owners like his offer and sell him all that infrastructure. After all, they weren't making as much money on it anyway, they didn't really know what they were doing, the water quality was bad, they had a large maintenance backlog, and most people in Einville just went on collecting rainwater and boiling it anyway. So they are more than happy to just pull the golden parachute and get rid of all their problems and go on to do something else. Following the acquisition, Billy Bob founds the Bill and Robert Water Company. Now everyone in town is his current or potential customer. Billy Bob has his workers connect his purifiers to the system, feeding the pipes with his water. He also spends on maintenance, replacing rusty pipes and leaky valves, which increases the water quality and reduces water loss. His customer base starts to grow rapidly. People happily sign the contract, stating that they'll get the water cheaper than under the previous orders and at a guaranteed higher quality. They can also disconnect from Billy Bob's pipes for the equivalent of $1,000 as a service fee, but why would they? The water is cheaper great. 
As time goes on, other people try to get in on the water business too, offering their own water from their own purifiers. Only a few people switch over though, since Billy Bob's water is reasonably priced and of high quality, and there is a thousand dollar disconnect fee which nobody wants to pay. But then a true prodigy appears, an even greater man who creates a water purifier that's even better than Billy Bob's. Worse, he starts selling the water from it, and some people actually switch over and they are very satisfied with the water. It's even cheaper and even better quality. And this even greater man even starts making some money on his business, sucking away profits from Billy Bob. Now Billy Bob gets word of this, so he visits this prodigy personally and offers to buy out his business, but he gets rejected. Now the actions of this prodigy directly threaten Billy Bob's business. He must neutralize this threat as soon as he can. Billy Bob goes on to use his considerable wealth and leverage to artificially lower the price of water even below the competitor's price. Although he goes into the red somewhat, he has enough money stockpiled to survive. The prodigy less so by virtue of being a small business. He also has to lower his price to compete, otherwise nobody would buy water from him. His customers start to dwindle, many switching back over to Billy Bob, who announces a $500 water coupon bonus to be given to all returning customers. After months of losses, the prodigy is at the end of his rope. He spent every bit of money on keeping his business alive. He sold absolutely everything he could, now living on the barest of necessities in an empty apartment, perhaps one month away from eviction. So Adam Something's premise is already ridiculous, as I pointed out, but at least now he makes it a little bit more realistic. At least briefly. You have a competitor coming into the market because it is highly profitable. This is something that happens, and is bound to happen. In this case, the competitor outperforms Billy Bob and starts taking his customers, which again is something that is bound to happen. But where Adam something goes next is absolutely ridiculous and discredits his entire video from this point on. Well, assuming it wasn't already discredited. Quote unquote predatory pricing is a common myth spread by anti-market fundamentalists. The problem with this is, number one, it's never happened before, at least not successfully, and number two is it's extremely unlikely to even be attempted, for many reasons. As Thomas Sowell says in his book Basic Economics, one of the popular myths which has become part of the tradition of antitrust law is predatory pricing. According to this theory, a big company that is out to eliminate its smaller competitors and take over their share of the market will lower its prices to a level that dooms the competitor to unsustainable losses and forces it out of business when the smaller company's resources run out. Then, having acquired a monopolistic position, the larger company will raise its prices, not just to the previous level, but to new and higher levels in keeping with its new monopolistic position. Thus, it recoups its losses and enjoys above normal profits thereafter, at the expense of consumers, according to the theory of predatory pricing. One of the most remarkable things about this theory is that those who advocate it seldom even attempt to provide any concrete examples of when this ever actually happened. Perhaps even more remarkable, they have not had to do so even in courts of law and antitrust cases. Nobel Prize winning economist Gary Becker has said, I do not know of any documented predatory pricing case. Yet both the A&P grocery chain of the 1940s and the Microsoft Corporation in the 1990s were accused of pursuing such a practice in antitrust cases, but without a single example of this process having gone to completion. Instead, their current low prices, in the case of A&P, and the inclusion of a free internet browser in Windows software, in the case of Microsoft, have been interpreted as directed toward that end, though not with having actually achieved it. Since it is impossible to prove a negation, the accused company cannot disprove that it was pursuing such a goal, and the issue simply becomes a question of whether those who hear the charge choose to believe it. Predatory pricing is more than a theory without evidence. It is something that makes little to no economic sense. A company that sustains losses by selling the low cost to drive out a competitor is following a very risky strategy. The only thing it can be sure of is losing money initially. Whether it will ever recover enough extra profits to make the gamble pay off in the long run is problematic. Whether it can do so and escape the antitrust laws as well is even more problematic. And antitrust laws can lead to millions of dollars of fines and or the dismemberment of the company. But even if the would-be predator manages somehow to overcome these formidable problems, it is by no means clear that eliminating all existing competitors will mean eliminating competition. Even when the rival firm has been forced into bankruptcy, its physical equipment and the skills of the people who once made it viable do not vanish into thin air. A new entrepreneur can come along and acquire both, perhaps at low distress sale prices for both the physical equipment and the unemployed workers, enabling the new competitor to have lower costs than the old. 
and hence be a more dangerous competitor, able to afford to charge lower prices or to provide higher quality at the same price. I highly recommend going and reading Basic Economics, especially you, Adam Something. His writing on Monopoly specifically is absolutely fantastic. Now, I'm going to strongman here a little bit and assume people might bring up examples of predatory pricing such as Standard Oil. For those people, I will direct you to economist John McGee and his peer-reviewed article in the Journal of Law and Economics, Predatory Price Cutting, the Standard Oil Case. McGee writes, Standard Oil did not use predatory price discrimination to drive out competing refiners, nor did its pricing practice have that effect. Whereas there may be a very few cases in which retail kerosene peddlers or dealers went out of business after or during price cutting, there is no real proof that Standard's pricing policies were responsible. I am convinced that Standard Oil did not systematically, if ever, use local price cutting in retailing or anywhere else to reduce competition. To do so would have been foolish. And whatever else has been said about them, the old Standard organization was seldom criticized for making less money when it could readily have made more. In some respects, it is too bad that Standard did not employ predatory price cutting to achieve its monopoly position. In doing so, it would surely have gotten no greater monopoly power than it achieved in other ways. And during the process, consumers would have bought petroleum products for a great deal less money. Standard would thereby not only have given some of its capital away, but would have also compelled competitors to donate a smaller amount. Now to finish off this section on predatory pricing, I want historian Tom Woods to tell you a little story. The difference between this story and Adam Something's story is this one is real and not a bedtime story that Adam made up in his head. One of my favorite stories from American business history, which I do include in, in the book, involves Herbert Dow. The name may ring a bell. He, runs the, he ran the Dow Chemical Company. He's dead now. He would be like 187 today or something. But he founded Dow Chemical around the turn of the century, into the 20th century. And he's a great chemical genius. And he was a really, really hard worker. I mean, really hard worker. He would work 18 hours a day and then sleep at his chemical factory and then start up his day again. Now, sure, it meant he grew like a second head and a third arm from hanging around chemicals all day, but it was rewarding enough for him to see his business prosper. Now, what's the deal with this Herbert Dow? He develops uh, a particularly cheap way of producing a chemical none of us use or have heard of called bromine. Now, bromine to, to this day is still used in film developing, in dyes. It's used, it's used to sedate people. There are a variety of, of uses for bromine, but he could sell it really cheaply. So he's selling bromine in the U.S., and... You know, as you, can, as you can guess, if you sell bromine in the U.S. for a while, after a while, you get a little bored with it. Where else can I sell bromine? So he thinks, how about Europe? I'll sell chemicals in Europe. No problem, right? Except if you try to sell chemicals in Europe, there are a group of, there's a group of German chemical sellers who don't want anybody else selling in Europe. So when Herbert Dow shows up in Europe and says, hey, I've got cheap bromine for everybody, this cartel of German producers knocks on his door and says, oh, no, you do not. You don't sell anything in Europe. We're the German cartel. We sell the chemicals in Europe. You're not going to sell anything. And he said, well, you know what? There's no law against it. I'm going to sell my chemicals here. And so the Germans got really upset. Who does this American upstart think he is? Well, they were selling bromine for 49 cents a pound. Herbert Dow's selling it for 36 cents. So, of course, everybody's buying from him, and nobody's buying from this German cartel. They're going crazy. What are we going to do to this guy? So they think, we'll destroy him. We will sell bromine in the U.S., at a price he can't possibly match, and that'll drive him out of business. So they were going to try predatory pricing. So the German cartel starts selling bromine right in Herbert Dow's backyard in the U.S. for 27 cents a pound. 27 cents a pound. So what's, what's Herbert Dow going to do? He can't possibly match that price. Well, he's clever. He's one of the cleverest businessmen you've ever seen. Because what he does is he has his purchasing agent go buy up tons and tons of his bromine at 27 cents a pound in the U.S., and then he goes to Europe and sells it, again, at, at uh, lower than 49. And so the Germans don't know what's going on, but they're saying, man, there's a huge demand in the U.S. for bromine, much bigger than we thought. How can we possibly keep up with this? So he's still going just fine. He's just buying it up at their price. So as time goes on, they lower it to 15 cents. We'll drive this guy out of business. We'll sell it at 15 cents a pound in the U.S. So he just keeps buying it up at their price and selling it in Europe. And the thing is that they're making losses. When they're selling bromine at 15 cents a pound, these Germans, they're making losses. They want to make up those losses selling at 49 cents a pound in Europe, but he won't let them. 
He keeps buying it up and selling it cheaply in Europe. So finally they reduce it to 10 and a half cents a pound. I mean, this is going to kill them. And finally, they, finally, 1908, he gets another knock on his door. Not nearly as brusque as that first knock. And so finally, so they, finally they, uh, they say to him, well, how about this? How about we sell bromine in Germany, you sell in the United States, but the rest of Europe is open to free competition. What do you say to that? And he said, okay. And so by just sticking to his guns, he, uh, Herbert uh, Dow totally defeated and uh, this uh, predatory pricing attempt and became quite wealthy in the process. Did, did very well and, uh, and, and established, in effect, a free market in, uh, in chemicals for the future. So using both this economic theory and these two historical examples, we can determine that either Billy Bob would decide it is way too risky for him to lower his prices, or he might do it. Maybe his competitor will go out of business, and then someone else will show up and purchase all of his equipment and hire his workers at a discount. That person may have more money to invest and not as much to lose. So if Billy Bob continues with his predatory pricing efforts, eventually he will have suffered way too many losses. Alternatively, Billy Bob could lower his prices and his direct competitor could start buying up his water or buying up his purifiers. He may also go to other places because, you know, other places do exist outside of this one town that Adam something creates in a vacuum and sell his superior water filters and purifiers there. And that may subsidize his income for this particular town where he is directly competing with Billy Bob. And then eventually Billy Bob gets to the point where he cannot take these losses anymore. In both these instances, the story stops here, and Adam Something's argument goes nowhere. He can try the same example with another person, but with that person, the same thing is going to happen. Now, for the specific video that I'm responding to right now, I would like to go more into it, but like I just pointed out, it doesn't go anywhere else. The rest of his argument completely depends upon predatory pricing, which is the absolute weakest foundation he could have come up with. But I will humor him a little bit. Let's say Billy Bob does start buying up every other business and everything else. And what he does is just monopolizes everything. This just becomes central planning. Now the town is the Soviet Union, basically. It's socialism. It's exactly what Adam something wants anyways. At this point, Billy Bob is just going to face the exact same types of problems that Stalin did. He's going to have all these issues with central planning and create a completely unsustainable economy. And dare I say, an impossible one. Now, Adam Something does have two sequels to this video, but somehow he makes these on even shakier foundations than this one. The second one, for example, completely depends on the assumption that he completely made up in his head, 20% of the population will be extremely poor and not be able to afford anything. This completely ignores the fact that in every conceivable way, capitalism has been the liberator of the poor and the thing that brings people out of poverty. Whereas socialism can be accredited for quite the opposite. Now let's make this assumption that you have a capitalistic society with this very poor part of the population. We had this in a way in America during the late 1800s and early 1900s. And what happened is people started welfare. State welfare didn't exist, so there was a place to be filled. And what people did is they created a welfare system that was even better than the state welfare system that came after it. Now, of course, the best piece of work on this is David Beto's book, From Mutual Aid to the Welfare State. My friend Mentis Wave did make an excellent video summarizing the book. I will link it in my description, along with many other sources on things such as the production of fence in an anarcho-capitalist society. In David Beto's book, he points out that many of the poorest people became part of these mutual aid and fraternal societies. There was also the medical lodge practice. David Beto says the leading beneficiary of lodge practice was, of course, the patient of modest means. He or she was able to obtain a physician's care for about $2 a year, roughly equivalent to a day's wage for a laborer. For comparable amounts, some lodges extended coverage to family members. The remuneration the lodge doctor received was a far cry from the higher fee schedules favored by the profession. The local medical society in Meadville, Pennsylvania, was typically in setting the following minimum fees for its members. 
$1 per physical examination, surgical dressing, and daytime house call, and $2 per nighttime house call. Such charges, at least for ongoing service, were beyond the reach of many lower-income Americans. Hence, it was not coincidental, an editorial in the Medical Council pointed out that lodge practice thrived in communities populated by the working poor. But unfortunately, people with similar ideas as Adam Something decided this wasn't good enough. So they essentially banned many of these forms of mutual welfare and fraternal societies, and they developed their own state welfare, which became significantly more expensive and significantly less efficient. The private welfare system holds every single pro of state welfare, such as the fact that it's nonprofit and easily accessible to poor people, but it also had every single pro of private competition, such as lower prices through competition and numerous options that could fit individual preferences. Anarcho-capitalists have been thinking about these things really for hundreds of years. Not only that, but many people throughout history have just intuitively started these institutions. As I mentioned earlier, Iceland, Acadia, Caspia, and of course the example I just gave, the private welfare systems of the United States, the UK, and Australia. But Adam Something ignores all of this. He doesn't want to actually research other ideologies. He just approaches them through bad faith and maliciousness. You can tell how unfamiliar he is with the ideology by the fact he thinks Ayn Rand was an anarcho-capitalist, or even popular among anarcho-capitalists. Ayn Rand, the supporter of gun control, the person who didn't believe in self-ownership, and who absolutely hated anarchism and libertarians. This is why I say that Adam Something should debate an anarcho-capitalist such as myself, or at the very least read some anarcho-capitalists. Again, I will put several sources and pieces of reading in the description for people to check out. The two best books I recommend that have a large culmination of these arguments are A Spontaneous Order and The Voluntary City. They are both very well presented and well researched books that cover a lot of topics and a lot of questions that people have about anarcho capitalism. If you're not willing to read stuff like this, then you shouldn't bother critiquing anarcho capitalists. You can't critique someone you don't understand. Dan.